Okay. We're at lesson two of this can happen. Let me actually get off. Let me get away this. Start video. Okay. Can you hear me? Oh, there you are. Um, lesson two of this can happen. Last week, we put a significant amount of time into reading, looking at numbers, looking at the numbers of how the world is doing today. And I know that I learned a few things that maybe there's, there's a little bit to be skeptical of, but I think overall it's can't, there's not really much room for debate that people are living longer and that the world is becoming a greater place. We tied these, some of these ideas back in with uh, the prophecies of Isaiah, Zechariah, and and uh, Mashiach sounds great. I, I, I saw lots of people nodding. Yes, Messiah is great. I, I, I'm in. Who's voting? Count me in. Um, today we are going to explore another dimension of Mashiach, and um, we're going to go read through the Rambam, Maimonides, and the way that he describes the Mashiach. Last week, we got a little tidbit of it, but now you're going to read the full text. Um, like I said, last week, we were focusing exclusively on the physical element of Mashiach, and today we're going to talk a little bit more spiritual. So, let me... Okay. Who needs redemption? So let's go, let's go right away to text number one on page 45. And this is from Maimonides. The King Mashiach is destined to arise and restore the sovereignty of the house of David to its former rule. He will build the temple and gather the dispersed of Israel. In his days, all the Torah's laws will be reinstated. When there arises a king from the house of David who studies Torah, fulfills the mitzvahs like his ancestor David in accordance with both the written Torah and the oral Torah, and he will influence all of Israel to walk in its ways and repair its breaches, and he will fight the battles of God, he is presumed to be the Mashiach. If he does this and is successful and he builds the temple in its place and gathers the dispersed of Israel, then he's definitely Mashiach. He will then improve the entire world to serve God together as it's written. Then I will transform the nations to a pure language and they will all call upon the name of God and serve him with one purpose. In that era, there will be no famine, war, no envy or competition for goodness will be in abundance and all delights will be as commonplace as dust. The sole occupation of the world will be only to know God as it is written the earth will be filled with the knowledge of God like waters covered the sea. So how does that sound? You still looking forward? Yes. So we could spend time on, uh, on dissecting all of the things. I recommend that afterwards you go uh, read through this again because there's that there's a lot packed into these few paragraphs but you can see you know we're talking about building a temple again we're talking about you know sacrifices we're talking about ritual purity we're talking about everybody doing all the mitzvahs and so we've got this temple and we're gathering the dispersed from israel um, it, it reminds me of a joke. There was, uh, back in Poland, there was, there was a, a Jewish fellow, he went to the synagogue, and the rabbi was speaking about Mashiach, he runs home and he says to his wife, Yeta, Yeta, the rabbi said Mashiach is coming. She says, oy vey, this is terrible news. He says, Yeta, what do you mean terrible news? This is wonderful, Mashiach is... She says, 
after so many years of struggling, we finally have enough money. We were able to redo the floor. We were able to repaint the, we were able to repaint the house. And now finally you're telling me we're picking up and we're moving to Israel. And he says, he says, but yet to think about it, the Cossacks, they won't be bothering us anymore. So she says, in that case, let Mashiach take the Cossacks to Israel. <laughs> it's it, it's all my as far as if you're talking to me about a about a beautiful world, no famine, no uh, no disease, uh, no poverty, all that I can handle. But once you tell me that I have to I have to move to Israel, come on! I I just built my house. I'm just getting settled. It's. Uh, <clears throat> this part of Mashiach is a little bit harder to digest. Um, is it possible to have a perfect world without this? Maybe, maybe we can take, you know, the parts that, that we can all relate to, and then well, why do I have to believe in these other, these other parts, the spiritual stuff, Maybe you could say two thousand years ago, this is what this is what people wanted when the temple they lost the temple. Then for the next few decades, they're saying, "Oh, I want my temple again. I want my temple back." But today, in two thousand and twenty, is that really is it really necessary? Oops. In order to have a perfect world, do I really need to have? I need to have all of these uh, all of these prophecies. So. To answer these, we're going to go, let's, let's uh, look over here. The two questions. Why does the messianic goal of a better world require universal recognition of God, full implementation of Torah and mitzvahs? That, that it almost sounds, it sounds like a, it sounds like a, a scary world. Everybody's going to have to believe who's going to be the belief police. We want freedom, don't we? And then. The second question, why isn't it enough to work for world peace and for the elimination of violence, poverty, and disease, as we said? So today we're going to switch gears and we're going to talk about what we might use the words, the soul of Mashiach. Last week we spoke of the body of Mashiach, and now we're going to talk about the soul of Mashiach. The body is all these physical promises, prophecies. And now the soul of Mashiach is what we're getting to now, the spiritual element of it. So we're going to kind of progress as we go along uh, this evening. But first, we're going to, uh, we're going to, I guess, un underline, we're going to get our bearings of where Mashiach stands in Judaism. Uh, someone last week asked the question, is, is Mashiach... Is it a Chabad belief, or is this like, like, does all Judaism believe in this? And so this is, this is exactly where we're going to start today. Um, the first thing that we're going to look at is the Amida, the Shemona Esrei. Jewish people pray three times a day, four on Sabbath. And in our prayers... The Shemona Esrei means 18 blessings. So these are 18 blessings. This is like the centerpiece of the prayer, morning, afternoon, and evening, three times a day. And uh, as I spoke with someone in this group, the reason why these prayers were instituted, the rabbis wrote them down in a book for us to read, is because they found that people didn't know what they really wanted. This is maybe the biggest problem in life. People don't really know what they want. They say, yes, I want the new bicycle, but they don't really know what they want. Maybe the bicycle is not the best thing for them. So the rabbis instituted, the rabbis of the Talmud 2,000 years ago, they, they wrote down the prayers into the prayer book. And we read it because these are the important things that we should be asking for. Um, so on page 47, you can see in text 2... Um, 
we're gonna we're not even gonna read all of them we're gonna let's start with with the tenth blessing these are these are seven out of the 18 blessings think about that seven out of 18 so that's that's like more than 70 percent of the not 70 percent more than uh gosh seven out of eight seven out of 18 is is almost 50 percent of the blessings are asking for the Mashiach. And this is what all Jews in every prayer book are asking for. So let's go to the 10th blessing. Um, Sound the great shofar for our freedom. Raise a, ban our, raise a banner to gather our exiles and bring us together from our four corners of the earth into our land. Blessed are you, Lord, who gathers the dispersed of his people Israel. Uh, let's skip to the 14th. Return in mercy to Jerusalem, your city, and dwell therein as you have promised speedily established there in the throne of David, your servant, and rebuild it. Soon in our days, an everlasting edifice. Blessed are you, Lord, who rebuilds Jerusalem. And the 15th blessing here. Speedily cause the sign of David, your servant, to flourish and increase his power for your, uh, by your salvation. For we hope for your salvation all day. Blessed are you, Lord, who causes the power of salvation to flourish. And, and then the 17th one is we're asking, look, look with favor, uh, restore the service to your sanctuary and accept with love and favor your fire offerings and prayer. We're asking God, we want your temple. We want to, we want to go back to the temple and start and, and start offering these sacrifices again. So this is, these are blessings again, that everybody's making. This is not a Chabad thing. Everybody's making and seven out of 18 blessings are about this, about Mashiach. We're now, uh, we'll go talk about a couple other things that we've just seen in the daily prayers, the, the significance that Mashiach holds. Um, you can see over here the picture of someone washing their hands. You've seen the washing with the cup. And, and the reason that we wash with the cup, imagine everybody knows about this. You wash your hands before you eat bread. Why do we do this? You know, excuse me one second, Levi. I left the door open. I left the door open, but I actually am giving a class now. So you guys know what page we're on? He said 47, but I don't see where he's reading. Um, I, I, I'm sorry. It The text two started on page 47, but then we were, uh, we kind of skipped around. We didn't read all the blessings. Okay. Um, oh, I see. I see where they're numbered. Okay, never mind. Yeah, gotcha. No, no problem. Uh, now we're we're on page fifty-one. You can see uh, this. There's a chart over here. We just saw the daily prayers. Now in meal times, the reason we wash our hands is because the priests, before they would eat the truma, which is like their food that has the extra holiness, would wash their hands. So even though we don't need to do this today we nevertheless wash our hands. The, it's instituted. Everybody knows that we wash our hands because we want to continue this tradition. And, and we're asking, we want to have the real thing again, really purifying ourselves to eat the food in holiness. On the Jewish calendar, you can see the shank bone over there reminding us of the sacrifice. You probably remembered on... on uh, at the end of the Seder, you say, next year in Jerusalem, next year in Jerusalem. Uh, we also have, in, in a couple months, we're coming up to the three weeks and the nine days, which are days of mourning the destruction of the temple. These are um, the fast of Tisha B'Av, the day the temple was destroyed. So we're not forgetting about this. You probably also have seen uh, the, at the Jewish wedding, you see someone's about to break the glass. Everybody knows breaking the glass. Why do we break the glass? So there's the, some say that the reason is because it's the last time the husband's putting his foot down. Um, <laughs> but uh, on a more serious note, the reason why we do this we say, If I forget Jerusalem, I forget my right hand. 
even on the most happy day, the wedding day, you can't forget about the destruction of the temple. So we break a glass to, to remember the temple. And then finally, as we learned in the, in the last course, we were talking about death and mourning. Um, the, the reason why we get buried in the ground is, uh, has to do with Mashiach. The reason that the Kaddish that we say, the prayer of Kaddish, we say, Please God, bring us to Mashiach. We're, so these are, these are all, you know, think about it. Of, of all the observances, these, these ones are, everybody knows these. And no matter how religious is, someone is, or Chabad, or Hasidic, or Litvish, all the different all the different stripes of Judaism that there are, everybody does all of these things, and Mashiach is uh, pretty prominent. Um, an, another point. So we're just we're we're really building this idea. We're we're finding where Mashiach fits into Judaism. This is something I mentioned last week, but we're now going to go in. We're going to watch a little video. You can also turn to page 53, and you're going to see on figure 2-2, two, two, we're going to go three, through the 13 principles of faith. Now, like I mentioned last week, these principles of faith are, are basically, if you want to know if an ideology there's an ideology out there. You want to know, is it Judaism or is it just a cult? So the, the litmus test for whether something is Judaism is whether it checks all of these 13 boxes. So let's go watch this little video. Rabbi Moshe ben Maimon, known in Hebrew by his acronym Rambam, and in English as Maimonides, was the Jewish star of the 12th century and a luminary for humanity. One of the greatest codifiers of Torah law and a giant of Jewish philosophy, he formulated a list of the 13 principles of Jewish faith, or as he described them, Judaism's fundamental truths and very foundation. To this day, Jewish communities worldwide recite or sing summarized versions of Maimonides' 13 principles. 1. God exists. God is the essence of perfection and the primary cause of all existence. 2. God is one. He is not a composite or divisible, but the most absolute and unparalleled unity. 3. God is non-corporeal. He has no body or part. And all references to God couched in the terms of human experience, such as movement, rest, seeing, and speaking, are metaphors. 4. God is eternal. This also means that nothing pre-existed God or brought God into being. 5. We must serve God exclusively. That precludes worshipping any entity or force that God created or that we have imagined. 6. God communicates through prophecy. It takes hard work to become spiritually fit for prophecy, and even then, communication is entirely God's choice and initiative. 7. The prophecy of Moses is supreme. God chose him from all humanity, for all of time, to receive the highest degree of prophetic experience. 8. The Torah is of divine origin. The Torah scrolls every word, along with the explanations that Moses delivered to us orally, is all from God's mouth. 9. The Torah is not susceptible to change. It was delivered by God in deliberate form and never can or will be amended in any way. 10. God knows everything. This includes God's active attention to each individual at every moment. 11. God rewards and penalizes. God communicated his expectations and gave us the ability to choose. He assures that our choices bear consequences. 12. There will be a Messiah and a Messianic era. A time will come in which the Torah will be fulfilled in entirety, 
and we will fully benefit from the blessings that will ensure as a result. The Messianic era will be conducted by a mortal Messiah, a descendant of King David, who will become an unparalleled global leader. We must constantly anticipate his arrival. 13. There will be a resurrection of the dead. At some point, God will restore the departed souls of the righteous from heaven and recreate their bodies to participate in and benefit from a perfected world. These principles begin with God as the primary cause of existence and conclude with a perfected world. Our ancient sages revealed that the reason that God created all that exists is for us to actively build the perfected world of the messianic era. Okay. It's a lot. This is something it's probably worth referencing back to this page, reading through them, and, and you can find uh, th there's, a, there's a lot to read on these, on these 13 principles of faith. Um, but what I think is maybe the, the, the most important point to take out so that you have, we have these 13 principles of faith. This is what makes Judaism Judaism. And Mashiach takes up two out of these 13. Number one, the belief and anticipation in the Mashiach. And number two, the belief in the resurrection. Lisa, were you going to say something? All I was going to say is it looks like number nine in the book is a repeat of, of number three. Um, yes, I think. Yep, that is, looks like a mistake. What is number nine? The Torah is immutable, is immutable. Is that correct? Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that correction. If you'd like to correct your books, the Torah is immutable. Number nine. Thank you, Lisette, for catching that one. Mm -hmm. I did not catch it. <laughs> That's for sure. So Mashiach takes up two out of these 13 principles of faith. So let's, on page 54, um, here's a question, question for discussion. Why is the belief in and yearning for Mashiach so central to Jewish life? What makes in the belief the belief in Mashiach so fundamental to Judaism. So, you know, the, the same way, just like Judaism can't be Judaism without a God. If there's no God, then there's no point in doing anything that's Jewish. If there's no Torah, if the Torah is not from God, then there's no point in doing what the Torah says. And so somehow Mashiach fits in there the same way that if, if there's no Mashiach, then the entire Judaism somehow becomes meaningless. Because that's what these 13, each one of these 13 principles, like you need all 13 to be Judaism. If you're missing even one, then it's just, it, it's meaningless. So I'm going to, we can take a couple minutes now to discuss this. Why do you think, why, why would a Mashiach be so fundamental that if, that without it, Judaism would be meaningless. Come on. Um, could you say the idea would be like the Messiah or the belief in the coming of the Messiah is kind of like the North Star to navigation. So okay. it, it provides a direction or a, a, not an end point so much as a focal point, maybe. It gives us something to look forward to, something to motivate us, to drive us. Is that what you're saying? Well, it gives us a, a direction or a, um, like a purpose, maybe that's i i'm glad that you said that i'm glad that you said that we're hopefully we're gonna we're gonna uh, frame things a little bit differently but it's good that you said that because i think 
that that's what a, a lot of us might be thinking. Is that anybody else thinking along those lines or have something different? Uh, I would say that it's, um, I, I mean, I, I, I agree with the perspective. I think a lot of people see things from that perspective, but another perspective would be that the promise that Hashem made to Avraham, it, 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 it can only reach its ultimate fulfillment via Mashiach. Mm -hmm. so, so Judaism, the, the foundation upon which everything is built, the entire history, the entire hope, the entire promise is dependent upon Mashiach. Very good. Very good. These are two important perspectives and, and let's, we'll continue, we'll continue talking about these. Thank you. Thank you for that, Sarah. Um, you know, there could be another, uh, another way of, another suggestion that maybe Mashiach is kind of, it's a response to life being miserable. Now, people could say, well, you know, I need something to, I need some hope. I need some hope to, when I lay down at night, something to wake up in the morning, something to wake up for. So the Mashiach is something to wake up for. I have something to, to feel good about. But, and there's no question that, that the Mashiach helped and helps the Jewish people go through hard times. You know, they, they were singing this song on the way to the gas chamber. And at the same time, we're going to go read in text number three. Let's, let's turn to page 55. Um, and we're going to see text three, which is the verse from Deuteronomy. So this is in the Torah. This is Moses' last speech. Right when the Jews, the, the, you know, they were in the desert for 40 years. And at the end of the 40 years, Moses gave the longest speech that a rabbi ever gave, 40 days long. Every day, every morning, they, everybody would wake up and they'd, they'd go to the, to the tent, the tent of meeting, and Moses would, from morning until night, he would continue his speech. And that is the whole Deuteronomy. The whole book of Deuteronomy, the fifth book of the Torah, is that speech. So here's a, a quote from from the Torah. So this is straight from the Torah. God will return your exiles. He will have mercy upon you. He will return and gather you from all the nations amongst whom God has scattered you. If your outcasts will be at the ends of the heavens, from there God will gather you. From there he will take you. God will bring you to the land of your ancestors, possessed, your ancestors possessed, and you will possess it. And he will do you good and multiply you more than your ancestors. And you will return and listen to the voice of God and fulfill all his commandments. So this is, just think about this. They're just on the other side of the Jordan River. They're just about to go into Israel for the first time. And Moses is not only telling them that, Moses is not only telling them Oh, you're going into Israel now. No, he's telling them there's going to be an exile and then you're going to come back. So Mashiach is not just a response to a, the problem of exile. Mashiach predates that. Moses is talking about Mashiach even before there was an exile. Now we're going we're gonna to go rewind a little bit more going back to the very beginning of the Torah. So Mashiach is not just in Deuteronomy at the end of the five books. We're going to now go to the first verse of the Torah, the first two verses of the Torah in Genesis. Text 4a on page 56. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You, know, you probably know that one. And the earth was chaotic and desolate and dark lives was on the face of the watery depths and the spirit of God hovered upon the waters. So, okay, we know God created the heavens and the earth. There's this darkness, desolate darkness. And it says the spirit of God hovered upon the waters. What is this spirit of God that's hovering? What's hovering here? So there's a Midrash. Midrash is, uh, it's concurrent with the Talmud. It came at the same time, the same rabbis. And we're going to, 
have a quote from Rabbeinu Bachaya, who's a commentary, famous commentary, like a thousand years ago, bringing down this, bringing down and explaining this midrash. So this is now on page fifty-seven, uh, text four B. The spirit of God hovered upon the waters. This is the soul of Mashiach. So when it says the spirit of God hovered on the waters, we're talking about Mashiach. The meaning of this midrash is, this is the commentary. In this passage, God is foretelling the end at the beginning. The Torah's intention is to indicate the end of time at the very beginning of time to teach us that the ultimate purpose of God's creation of the world is the days of Mashiach. Thus, the original thought is actualized in the conclusion of the work. So, in other words, to say this very, very simply. Um, okay, I'm sorry, I missed this slide back here. Mashiach is not just a solution to exile. Moses was prophesying about it uh, and th about the exile and redemption at the same time. The reason why Mashiach, this spirit of Mashiach, that's the spirit of God in the second verse of the Torah is talking about Mashiach. Mashiach, in other words, Mashiach is the beginning of creation. The Rabbeinu Bachaya, he's telling us that, that Mashiach is not just something that came along later to solve problems. It's not just, and, and not, not, to, not to belittle anything that, that, that the answers that we heard before. It's, Mashiach is not just, it's not just a, a tool to help us through problems. It's not just, it's not just uh, something to give us hope. Mashiach is actually the purpose of creation. At the very beginning of creation, God said, oh, this is Mashiach. The very beginning of the, the, the spirit of God hovering on the waters, that's Mashiach, because Mashiach is the purpose of creation. So to summarize, and then uh, we can maybe, if anybody has questions, we can talk for a couple minutes. But yeah, in Rabbi, summary, I'm sorry. Yeah, Rabbi. Um, just one second. Let, let's just let's just okay. summarize, and then at this breaking point, then we'll we'll. So, Mashiach is a central pillar of Jewish faith. That was we saw from Maimonides. We saw that Mashiach is central to the Jewish prayer and practice. We saw that Mashiach predates the exile. Moses is talking about it before, before they went into Israel. And it even predates creation. Mashiach is the original thought is being actualized at the conclusion of the work, meaning the original thought is Mashiach. Yes, Kevin. Yes, yeah, so we view the, uh, there, there, there's another uh, scripture in, in the Torah that talks about Moshe saying, that Hashem will send a prophet like Moshe, like Moshe. and and uh, I would presume I would I take that to understand that that he is Mashiach, and uh, Mashiach is like Moshe. He brings that cohesiveness. He brings uh, he brings uh, us close to Hashem. He creates a situation where we're pointed to and directed to and and uh, follow Hashem, uh, you know, a, a restorer? Uh, or do we view, is that uh, scripture that Moshe, or that statement that Moshe meant, talking about something else? Um, I, I, I can't say that I, I remember the idea that you're saying, but to, to give a real answer, I would need to go, I would need to go, like, look at it. I could probably find it. Um, I could probably find it. Maybe if you find it, we can talk about that. Um, Mashiach is actually going to be, it says, close to the level of Moshe's prophecy. That was one of the foundations of uh, principles of faith is that Moses was the was and will be the greatest prophet ever. No one will will, will come uh, reach the level of prophecy that Moses got. But yeah, Mashiach, there's definitely... There are a couple of references to Mashiach, another another prophet close in, in level to, to Moshe. But we will be talking in a couple of weeks about the personality of Mashiach, because there are many different ways to, to you know, divide up the discussion. 
Last week, we were talking about physical. This week, we're talking more about spiritual. You can also divide it by the era of Mashiach, the time period, and then the person. And so we're going to get to the person in a, in a couple weeks. So, so um, um, yeah. So is this indicating that while the person is not here, the soul existed at the same time or prior to at the beginning of creation? Because it's... This midrash is literally saying the spirit of God is the soul of Mashiach. So how exactly does that work? Does Mashiach come from God? How does that work? So we're going to, thank you for that question, because that I think is going to lead us into the rest of the discussion. Um, we're really going to get to what is Mashiach. Not just, okay, we, we know now about some prophecies. There was even someone who... They, they showed us, I don't, you know what, if you give me a second, I think it's worthwhile. I'm sorry, it's going to take me a second, but I'll, I'll I want to get this, I want to get this image. I'm going to pull it over the, uh, I'm sorry. Give me just a second and we'll, uh, Why is this taking time? There we go. Okay. You see that? Yeah. This is um this is it's an elephant. Everybody's looking at their little perspective of it. It's a, from one perspective, it's a fan. From another, from the tusk, it's a, it's a spear. From the trunk, from the trunk, it's a snake. From the legs, it's a tree. From the tail, it's a rope. From the body, it's a wall. So e each one of these guys are they're looking at at one little part. But yeah. the truth is, what is it? It's not. It's not a wall. It's not a spear. It's an elephant. Yeah. It's so. So what we're getting to when we say the soul of Mashiach, what is Mashiach? Okay, so yes, we know there are prophecies and there's no going to be no poverty and, and there's going to be, there, we won't have this problem and we know we're going to have a temple. But what is Mashiach? Uh, as okay. Sarah pointed out again, this text is telling us, the Midrash is telling us, this, this spirit of God, this is Mashiach, this is right in the beginning of the creation of the world. The Mashiach is the purpose of creation. So let's get in to that. This is what we're going to zoom in on. This is what Mashiach is. Um, well, if, I'm sorry? If you um, look where he's saying that, um, you know, back with the, in the beginning, it, you have darkness and chaos. Yes. And I remember from an early, and then, then you have the calming and, and that's, that's the Messiah, and, um, or, and not, or, well, well, no, not really, but that the Messiah is the one who calms all of the chaos. In no, an, that, that, no, I'm because it, it, it earlier didn't. in one of the lessons we went from um, we we learned that God allows chaos before you can have the structure or the organization good. To... good you're talking about the flood i think okay i think you're talking about the flood and that, and that's good that's an, that's another discussion there is the the water was raging and then it calmed down and and there's a purpose in that over here this is this is saying in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth this is what the earth looked like it was chaotic desolate darkness was on the the watery depths and the spirit of god was there hovered on the waters what is the spirit of god mashiach so right in the beginning, God, the spirit of Mashiach, was right there from the beginning. Now let's, let, let's go, and I think some of these things will, will uh, become a little bit clearer. Um, now we're really going to rewind, and we're going to ask the biggest, the ultimate question, Okay. And for some people, maybe the, I don't know, some people like talking about this. I think everybody can appreciate this. 
what's the purpose of the world? We're saying Mashiach is the purpose of the world. So let's let's take the word Mashiach out for a second. What is the purpose of the world? Why did God create a world? Uh, to build a place for him to dwell. Thank you, Mario. You, Mario comes to all of the classes and he hears uh, me and every other Chabad rabbi who he's been by say this over and over and over again. The purpose of the world is to create God a home. We're going to go look at some of the texts on this. Um, page 60, text number five. We are, this is from the Tanya. This is the Tanya is basically the Bible of Hasidus, the Bible of Chabad, you might say. And these are taking the teachings of the Zohar. And again, the in the Tanya, the Alter Rebbe is going to comment on a Midrash. So the Midrash is not a Chabad idea. The Midrash is 2,000 years old, the, from the, the same as the Talmud. The Tanya is going to explain it because the, a lot of these things in the Talmud are a lot is packed into a couple words and we need to unpack them. So this is what the Alter Rebbe is doing. So text five on page 60. As is known, the sages have said that the purpose of creation of this world is that God desired that he should have a home in the lowly world. God wants a home. So two points, home in lowly world. It is also known that the days of Mashiach and especially the time of the resurrection of the dead are the fulfillment and culmination of the creation of this world and the purpose for which it was originally created. So, oh gosh, now I have to go take this away so it doesn't... Okay, otherwise I'm going to keep getting beeped. <clears throat> So again, the point is we have, we want to make a home for God. The purpose of creation is for a home, number one, home, and number two, lowly world. So what is this lowly world? Why, what, what is so low? Why does it have to be low? Why It's like a condition. It has to be a low world. And that's even, maybe even a little bit derogatory. Why lowly? Just call it the physical world. So Text number six on page 61 is another quote from Tanya. This is what the human being is all about. This is the purpose of the human being's creation and of the creation of all the worlds, both the lofty and the lowly, that God should have a home in this lowly world. So now the Tanya is adding that it's not just one world. We have, there are multiple worlds. There are lofty worlds worlds that are high up, and then there are lowly worlds. And the purpose of all of these worlds, both the high world and the low worlds, is for God to have a home in this world. So, okay, this world means the one that we're all sitting in right now, not the Zoom cloud world, but maybe that too. We're talking about Earth, planet Earth, is the lowly world. But why call it lowly? What, what, why can't you just call it the physical world? Why can't you call it planet Earth, lowly world? By saying lowly world, it implies that there are higher worlds. Lowly is, is a strong statement. So we're going to go read the next text, text number seven. And this, is, this one is a long one. And basically... For the rest of the class, we're going to be referencing back to this text. This is going to unpack. It's deep and it's long, but it does have the answer to the question. So we're going to read it, and then we'll be unpacking it for the next 45 minutes. Not just this. So it progresses. Um, let's see. Okay. The purpose of creation is for God to have a dwelling place in this world. Okay. You see the shoes? 
you start off with clean shoes and then they get a little bit dirty and then more dirty and then very dirty, okay? So let's go into text number seven and think about these shoes as we're reading it. Now, in regard to God, the distinctions of higher and lower do not apply as God pervades all realms of existence equally. But the explanation of the matter is as follows. So here we go, high and low. You could have said that high worlds, or, you know, we'll, we'll get to that in a second. I'll explain it after. We'll just continue reading the whole text. Before the world was created, God was exclusively and singularly one. And he pervaded the entire space in which he created the world. Insofar as God is concerned, it is still the same now. The change brought about by the divine act of creation relates only to those on the receiving end of the vitality and energy that God infuses into creation, which they receive via the many garments that conceal and obscure the divine radiance. As it is written, for no human can see me and live. This is the concept of Hishtalshalus which is the downward descent of wor worlds. This is, Hishtalshalus means a chain. There's a whole chain of worlds. Level after level by means of a multitude of garments, we'll talk about that too, that conceal the energy and vitality that emanated from God until this physical and materialistic world was created, which is the lowest in degree, of which there's none lower in regard to the concealment of God's radiance. This is a world of doubled and redoubled darkness, to the extent that it is full of unholiness, namely elements that actually oppose God, declaring I am and there's nothing else besides me. Clearly the purpose of Ishtaushalus of the worlds and their descent level after level is not for the sake of the higher spiritual worlds as they constitute a descent from the radiance of the divine presence. Rather the ultimate purpose of creation is this lowest world. For such was God's desire, that he should derive satisfaction when the forces opposing godliness are overcome and when the darkness is transformed into light. The result is that the infinite radiance of God is revealed within this physical world, the place of darkness and the opposing forces with the advantage of the light that comes from darkness, within an even greater intensity than its revelation in the higher worlds. Okay, I hope you were reading along. It was long. It's long and... And we're going to go unpack it one thing at a time. So <clears throat> the two ideas, two main ideas from this text number seven, this long text, is number one, this idea of hishtalshalos, which is a chain of worlds. The chain of worlds, descent, one higher and one lower. And number two, why God desires a home specifically in this world. Why does God want the bottom? So you have all these, there are all these higher worlds. We're at the bottom. We're the dirty shoes. You have the clean shoes all the way up there. We're the dirty shoes, but God wants the dirty shoes more than the clean shoes. The question is why? Um, So let's go to the first thing, the Hishtalshalus, this chain. You can look on page 65. Um, okay. God gets this satisfaction from turning darkness into light. So God doesn't want the dirty shoes just because he wants dirty things. Because he likes dirty shoes, God gets satisfaction out of cleaning dirty shoes. So figure two, four is in your books on page 65. These are the four general worlds. They say that the, each one of these uh, worlds comes into millions of, of different gradations and there are sub worlds and different levels within the world. But these are the four main worlds. So you have this highest world called Atsilus and you have the lowest world called Asiya. What makes the higher world higher and what makes the lower world lower? You might say that higher means it's closer to God. Lower means further away from God. 
but that's exactly that's the first point if we look back at this text seven that's the opening paragraph higher and lower doesn't apply to god sorry close higher and lower god is not close or far from anything god is everywhere god's everywhere equally he's he's just as much in the highest world as he is in the lowest world because god's everywhere so what does it mean it's not close and far it is revealed and concealed this is the this is the a key idea for today revealed and concealed so let's take an example of something that i don't understand very well the theory of relativity okay now the theory of relativity it's an idea it's a truth you know how i know it's true because there was a bomb <laughs> and there were there are nuclear power plants that's how you know that it's real but take two class two rooms there's one room that has a bunch of preschoolers in it and there's another room that has a bunch of physicists this idea of e equals mc squared is it any more in one room over the other? The idea, the truth is everywhere the same. It's just as much in that room with preschoolers as it is in the room of physicists that are talking about this idea. The difference between them is in revealed and concealed. In the room of preschoolers, this idea of relativity is concealed it's something that's just it's a darkness maybe they they probably don't even know the words but if they do know the words it's just dark words it doesn't mean anything but that doesn't mean that the truth doesn't exist in that room just as much as it does in the room where it's revealed the physicists are talking about it they're debating back and forth they're trying to understand it so it's revealed over there but it's not any more there So back to these worlds, God, the, re, the existence of God, the reality of God, God's everywhere. God is in the highest worlds and God is in the lowest worlds. The, the lowest world where we are, we're a world of dirty shoes. We're a world of preschoolers. The idea of God, the reality of God is... It's here, but God's concealed. We don't see God. In the higher world, doesn't mean that it's closer to God. The higher world isn't any closer, but God is revealed in the higher worlds. How does it happen? How, how, how does this revealed and concealed happen? So let's, here are the four worlds. We're going to play a little Hebrew word trick over here. This word on the screen, olam, means world. You probably know the word tikkun olam. Olam is world. But the word world in Hebrew, you can see, you can probably see my mouse, helam. Helam, this letter, ayin lamed mem, ayin lamed mem. This, the, the, the same, the root word of world is the same as concealment. So what's happening is that God is everywhere, but God starts concealing himself. He puts over, and the example they give is like a shade. You can put over one, you have a big window, and you can put over one shade, and it takes away the intensity of the light. You can put another shade, and then the more and more shades you put, eventually you're going to have a blackout. You have blackout curtains. When you go to the, when you go to the Home Depot, you can you say I want to buy some window dressings, and they say, well, which kind would you like? Would you like blackout dressings? Would you like just the? the would you like something that's just going to uh, make it so you can't see through? So these are each one of these layers, so to speak, of concealment. That's another world. So back here, Atzilus 
it's a world. It's also a world. There's also a concealment. And then there's a, the Bria has more concealment. And then Yitzira, there's another concealment. And then Asiya is another concealment. And you can see each time it's getting darker and darker. Okay. Let's take a second. We'll go back to um, page 53. Um, just for a moment. We're going to review the first four principles of faith. There's a God who's perfect in every way, not dependent on any other existence. He's absolutely one. No composite parts or aspects within his being. God is not physical. God is timeless, eternal. Imagine if you could see that. I can see all of you. I know that all of you are here. Imagine if you could see God in the same way. Right now, you know, there are many people who believe. But belief is a choice. Belief is a belief is something that each person has to it's a journey that each person embarks on. Do I believe in God? But there's one, one thing for sure. God is not here in the same way that another person is here. God is hiding. And it requires belief. Imagine a world where that was not the reality. Imagine if you could see God. Not Obviously, God doesn't have a body. But imagine if God's existence was so... Imagine if you could... It was as real to me as seeing another person. Well... That's for sure not what we have now. What we have now, what we have now is a world where this is the lowest world. The lowest world. It's so low that you can't see God. That you, there's no proof that God is here. In all the higher worlds, that's that's not the case. This is the only world where someone can deny the existence of God. And you know how there's nothing lower? How do I know that there's nothing lower? What's the ultimate truth? The ultimate truth is God's existence. So what's the ultimate untruth? Denying God's existence. And that's possible here. There's nothing, there can't be anything lower than where we are right now. Okay, so why is this? Why is this that we that we don't see it. Why don't we see God? Let's go to text eight on page 67. This is also from the Tanya. The fact that every creation and event appears to us as tangible and real is only because we do not apprehend and see with our physical eyes, the godly energy and divine breath within each creation. But if the eye were allowed to see and apprehend the vitality and spirituality being infused into every creation by the divine utterance, the physicality, materiality, and substance of that creation would be utterly invisible to us. And such, there literally is nothing besides him. So in other words, the real existence is God. Because God is so hiding, he's hiding so much, that's the only reason why we don't see him. And if we did see God, we wouldn't even see materiality as, as valuable. Rabbi, if this interesting way you're putting this and, and even in the 13 principles of faith uh, as you just said like a number of times the ultimate truth is is is, is god it's, it's the ultimate truth yep. i always had a problem with why 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 then do we use such wishy-washy words like believe what what does that mean and 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 what does it mean believe with complete faith where's where's the faith meter um you know what, what it's it it seems to me uh, why don't we say we know? Uh, and some of the things you're saying suggest that we know. It's just we can't prove, but we know. And if knowledge means we must have proof, this is this is different. This is a different situation. So I, I just I've always had a problem with with this idea of the ultimate truth being Hashem, ultimate truth being God, but we can only believe it. We can't know it. We can't know it. It, it's it, it's very weak. It, it sounds. Like it is. It is, and 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 I'm I'm glad you said that. I, I don't. 
it's very easy. We could we could go on the conversation of what is uh, what is belief versus knowing. I, I think the what the the relevant to the conversation now is is that this world right now the way things are you can't prove god's existence scientifically and this is mashiach this is what we're working for go find it someday someone's going to find that truth but this this whole idea that that right now yes this is the lowest of the low doubled and redoubled darkness this is the world that we're living in and God wants a home in this world. God wants it like this. God wants it to be con- God wants to be concealed. And then the point is that in this world we're going to break out of this world. And we're going to and, and and that's not the the purpose is not to stay like this. And, and well please remind me at the end we can talk about we'll continue talking about this. Um So let's going, sorry. No. So God's concealment allows us to possess a sense of self and perceive ourselves in, as an existence. So it's almost, an, it's an illusion, not almost, it's an illusion. The fact that everything that we have in our existence, it's nothing compared to God's infinite existence. Now, the argument that it was making in all of these texts, number number uh, five and six and seven, is that the purpose of all of the worlds, the higher worlds, meaning the world's atzilus, the highest world that has a tiny little bit of concealment, and all the worlds in between, the purpose of all of them is for this world that we're in right now. To, we, God wants us to make him a home in this dark world. Okay. Now we're gonna we're gonna kind of transition over, and we're gonna we're gonna ask why. And this, I think, may be the the most foundational idea, the biggest idea. If you're gonna walk away with an aha moment from today, I think this is it's gonna be the next idea. And the question is like this: God's perfect. Why does God need any of this? What could we possibly give to a God? Not a God, to God. So let's go to page 68. And we're going to read a little bit more about what we're doing to make God a home. If you wanted to make a God a home, what would you do? So page 68, text number nine. This is from Deuteronomy, so straight from the Torah. This mitzvah that I command you this day is not mysterious to you, nor is it far away. It's not in the heaven that you should say who will go up to heaven for us and get it for us and teach it to us so we can do it. Rather, the matter is very close to you in your mouth, in your heart to do it. Judaism is a very unique religion. Pretty much every other religion boils down to belief boils down to you believe in something. Judaism is not about belief. It's about action. There's so much action in Judaism. Let's go. uh, There are many religions that, that serve by abandoning the physical state in quest for a higher spiritual existence. Judaism is not like that. Judaism is a whole bunch of physical mitzvahs giving tzedakah, putting on tefillin, eating the apple and honey, making the hamantashen. Everything is action, action, action. And this is how we're making, this is how we make this home for God. But, but why? Why? 
if God just wanted spirituality, then you know what God would have done? Nothing. If you were God, before there was a world, it's just God. You were God. God's there. Perfect in every way. This is the question for discussion. So get ready to talk about this. Page 69. If you were perfect in every way, infinite, eternal, and utterly self-sufficient, what would there still be for you to desire? Perfection doesn't experience challenge, achievement, relationship, achievement, partnership. If you were God, what would you want? It's a discussion. How about what? I said, how about a peace-loving world? Now we're talking about before there's a world. Oh. Before yeah. it, 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 you're God alone. I guess. And, and you're not bored. You, you, you're not bored because you're infinite. You know, only a finite being could become bored. You're an infinite God and there's no world. What could you possibly want? Well, ba based on based on the way our world uh, w was created and set up, uh, he, I would say Hashem would want just like He made us to want relationship, and uh, a, a, a relationship can can has to be a two way a two way uh, street two way road, shall we say? Uh, without relationship, you're alone. So, so God, God was lonely. This is a good point that that we made because uh, it's very interesting. We said in an earlier slide that God gets satisfaction. What is so? We can't use any of these words really because uh, uh, God doesn't need satisfaction. It, it almost sounded to as well that if God wanted a home that means there was some sort of need that god had or it suggests that there is some sort of need well what does god need he doesn't really need anything we're using very human terms he he doesn't have satisfaction he doesn't necessarily have loneliness so it's very difficult sometimes to quantify these things we have to use words that we can we can the, the only things we have but they're they're, they're not enough they, they fall so, too far short. So in a sense, the same way God it, it gets satisfaction, then he's lonely. If he's, he's not lonely. lonely, then he doesn't need satisfaction. I mean, there's, there's, there's a, lot, a lot of things kind of interplay here, and we can't use one and then not the other. Um, Donnie, I, I don't want to... I don't want to pull you into the conversation if you don't want, but you're definitely welcome to chime in. Irv, I saw you were going to say something. You're, you're on muted. You're muted. In searching for an answer, it, it might be that God is it's almost like a chess game. He wants to have a challenge to create a perfect world, to create perfect relationships. I, I'll tell you the four things that are up on the screen, challenge, relationship, achievement, partnership, those are the most satisfying things that I can experience. The only reason that, I, that, that they're satisfying for me is because I'm limited. Because I'm finite, because I have, because I'm imperfect, the challenge and overcoming challenges is satisfying. Because I'm uh, because I'm finite, I can appreciate having someone else. Because because I could fail, that's why I get satisfaction from achieving. So so an infinite God. He's he's not lacking any of these things. He doesn't need the challenge. He doesn't need the relationship or achievement or partnership. God doesn't need that. So 
God has, basically, I would say there, there are two answers. Two answers to the question. One answer is an infinite God before there's a world. There's no world yet. One thing you could do is nothing. Just stay perfect. Stay perfect and infinite. You're still not lacking anything. But you, but you have a less than perfect world. This is be, this is before the world. Before there's a God. Before the uh, Rabbi, excuse yeah. me. Before the the lowly world, or before, before any world, the, before the, the first any world. Any world. So okay. there, there's another point which I I kind of glossed over, and that is, uh, in the Tanya, in that text number seven, the Alter Rabbi points out the purpose of the of all the worlds is for sure not for the highest worlds. It's for the lowest world, not the highest world. Why? Because the highest worlds are a concealment. Even the highest world is a little bit of a concealment. So to have, to, to, to that can't be the purpose. Obviously, the purpose of creation is concealment. And if the purpose is concealment, wherever the most concealment is, that's where the, that's where the real purpose is. Okay. So... So one, one option for God, an, a, an infinite God before there's a world, is to do nothing and just stay in existence. Stay in an infinite existence. A second option is what God actually did. God created a world that is so dark that it, it's, it's a world that's so dark that he's hiding and that, that, that he, that, that challenge and challenge and concealment and failure is a possibility and then nevertheless in that world for that world to nevertheless achieve this world that was that that god is hiding in that same world is going to go find god that is satisfying so in other words you could say that god experiences challenge through us okay you hear that idea god is experiencing challenge through us god doesn't can't experience challenge or god doesn't experience challenge himself because he's infinite okay god created us in order to experience to have all these experiences through us and so that's that's satisfying that's that is the one sat and, and and we still we can't even say that God was lacking this. God wasn't bored or lonely before. God didn't have to do this. But for some reason, there was this deep desire inside of God to have this kind of a world, a world that is full of challenge and full of, full of troubles and nevertheless to succeed. Yeah. Okay. So, so, er, so, let me introduce a word that I spend a lot of time thinking about in our Holocaust work, but yeah. last night I tuned in by accident to JBS, the Jewish Business Services TV network, and there was a professor who had been kind of a disciple of Elie Wiesel, and Elie Wiesel was focused on education, and he was focused on the word hope, mm -hmm. and as I'm listening, and I, I'm having trouble getting my arms around this whole discussion is that it seemed to me that hope might be a fifth parameter that you might put up on the screen. Okay. The, 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 what, 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 what we're doing is the difficulty we have is describing Hashem in our terms. And uh, the, yeah. the, the idea that Hashem needs any of these things, wants, desires, all these words, don't cut it, because all we can say is that Hashem did this. We cannot say the reason. We cannot think we know the reason. Yeah, he did this. These are the reasons. Possibly. Well, the, the thing, we can't say it on our own, but what we can do is, let's go back. Um, oh, let, let's let's go to just hold the pa page 60. Keep, keep your keep yourself here but on page 60 text number five as is known the sages have said this is from the midrash 
that the purpose of the creation of this world is that God desired that he should have a home in the lowly world. So there's a desire. And there, there's a lot of conversation about what this desire is. And it's something very deep. It's not, it's not a logical desire. It's not definitely not logic that we can understand, but it doesn't come from logic. It's somewhere deep inside, somehow, and this, this we can't explain, but for some reason, God had a very deep desire for getting this kind of pleasure. God had a deep desire to experience challenge and relationship and achievement and partnership through us. Okay, so then that would be why he forces the soul into the bodies so that the souls can uh, grow and develop and basically find their way back? Exactly. That is exactly text number 10 on page 70. Thank you. Oh, dang. And I've you're, been you're, always, you're <laughs> always one step ahead. Um, text number 10, page 70. Everything, this is uh, from the Midrash and then Rashi. Everything that God created in the six days of creation requires further doing. The mustard seed needs to be tempered. Legumes need to be softened. Grain needs to be milled. Even the human being requires fixing. Rashi, this is the meaning of what it says. All his work which God created to make. This is at the end of the creation. God, The Torah doesn't say God created and made. Rather, created to make. This is to teach that everything requires fixing. We are in the world to fix it. And this is what we've been doing for the last almost 6,000 years. Every person has their place. You have, the, you have the, the, the developers that are building cities and buildings and making the world beautiful. And you have the gardeners who are making, a be making beautiful gardeners, gardens. And you have, the, you, have the, the, uh, you have all the politicians who are, who are, who are fixing poverty. And, and uh, okay, you have... Every person has their the scientists who are coming up with with cures to diseases. You have the you have the the garbage the, the garbage people who are taking away the garbage. They're keeping the world beautiful. The ones who are laying the pipes. Every person that's what work is. Where every person has their place in making the world a good in, in, in fixing the world. So so Sonia is not on camera, but she wants to say something. Go for it, Sonia. Hi, Rabbi. Hello, Hi, Sonia. Everyone. Um, from what I can understand, Baruch Kadosh, Kadosh Baruch sorry, said that we are to be holy because he is holy. Mm -hmm. And we, ampl we amplify his holiness by his character, by do being kind, by being doing the mitzvahs. But, mm -hmm. but he really seems to want a relationship with us. Mm -hmm. And and he showed us what a relationship is supposed to look like, but unfortunately it doesn't work too well in this world, through marriage. Mm -hmm. He set apart to our husbands. And and uh, and of course, we probably everybody on the screen is married. And you know how difficult and challenging, but yet well worth uh being married to our spouses is but the father is using that to sharpen the the dull edges of our relationships and i believe that that's the whole purpose that we're here on this earth is to show the the character qualities of hashem in our lives and, and to have relationship with him. And the only way we have relationship to our holy God is to show, amplify, amp, um, to show his character in, his, in our lives. We cannot be like the world that we live around. We cannot speak like them. We can't talk like them. We can't act like them. We have to be set apart unto him. And I do believe that is why we have been placed on this earth to have a relationship with Hashem. And I myself who have come out of Christianity and then into Messianic and now into this wonderful world of Judaism can honestly tell you 
this is the true religion. There is no other religion that's more true than this religion. And, uh, and I believe also getting back to Moshiach at the beginning of the thing of your, um, of the, uh, awesome. of what you said, he says he's going to be immortal. And it tells us that in Ezekiel chapter 46, that he's going to be married and have children and he's going to, and, and there is no challenging, no more challenging relationship than in a marriage. And to love him and love Hashem, love our husbands, our spouses with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to, and to show his character in all of this. I'm sorry I'm being long-winded, but, um, but I, I just think it's, it's, I'm trying to encapsulate the whole thing in uh, this what? relationship. God yeah. wants a relationship and, and our part in this relationship is finding him. Absolutely, and to be like him. And I and think we can say on that. that note, on that note, let's go on text number 11, I think is saying exactly this, what, what Sonia is getting at. Look on page 71, text number 11. This is from Isaiah. No longer shall your master be cloaked. Your eyes will see your master. This is another messianic prophecy. So, God is concealed and we don't see God now. And it's the relationship with God is very difficult because we don't see him. And then, and we're, but we're working at it. We're working to, to, to break through all of these concealments. And then this is what Isaiah is saying. At, we're going to get to the point at which God will not be concealed anymore. He's going to take off the cloak. He's going to take off his mask, and we're going to see him. We're going to see God. And this is really, this getting back to the original question, let's see. An imperfect world that perfects itself is even greater than perfection. This is the idea. God's experiencing this through us, and, and God wanted a world that he's hiding in, and God wants us to go find him and but, have that relationship. But isn't that why God is sending Mashiach ben David, who is immortal, to show yeah. us how to have a relationship with the, Hashem? The, because, the actual, okay. the, the person of Mashiach we're going to get to, uh, we, we, someone brought it up earlier. We're going to get to that in, in uh, th that's going to be a couple weeks. Right now, we're still talking about the idea. Now, we're, we're bringing the body and the soul of Mashiach. Okay, that's what we were talking about. So the body of Mashiach is what we spoke about last week, that you have all of these uh, advancements in society and the, you look at the poverty rates at the death rates at the crime rates at the every every negative thing that's in the world it's going down that's the body of mashiach the reason why all of these things are happening the reason why we are finding the solutions to the to the problems that plagued humanity since the beginning of time this is because the soul of mashiach is is, is we're it's coming together that even these ideas, these ideas that we're talking about now, there weren't words for these ideas a thousand years ago. The Zohar, actually Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai was the first one 2000 years ago. But even that, not the way that we're talking about it now. This is very logical. This is the, These ideas, this is the soul of Mashiach. And we're getting there. And Kevin, this is your job, as you were talking about after the class last week, with all the guys, your job is to find God, to prove God's existence in the world through science, that science is not a contradiction to Torah, right? Right now, it, sometimes it's a little bit hard. It's, a, it, it's hard for scientists to believe because there are, it, it's, not, it, it's not unequivocal, but 
the, the, but that is the quest. We're finding, we're searching and we're getting closer. We're getting closer and closer and closer. Well, let me, let me just quickly say that we won't prove um, because uh, what we can do is we can find, we can find evidences uh, that are hard to dispute, but uh, Hashem is axiomatic. He has to be accepted. There, there's no proof. It's axiomatic. It's like, if I tell you two plus two is four, how do you know that? It's axiomatic. It's, 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 it's an, it's a physical law of nature. So, so to you see it. So you see well, no, it. You don't see it. What, what do you well, see? Two plus two, two plus two, you can see. You no, can you see. can't. If I put out four apples, you don't know it's four unless there's some axiomatic system that has, has led you to that. But I don't want to get into that now. That's, okay. That's, that's I, I can't up. argue with, I can't argue with you on that. We're finished. We're, we're just on time over here. Let's summarize. Okay, so the physical improvements to the world are coming together with the changing the world into something godly. This is the soul of Mashiach. This is the purpose of creation. Lesson two, who needs a redemption? One, Mashiach is more than a Jewish belief. It is one of the 13 foundations of Judaism and pervades every area of Jewish observance, Jewish history, and the Jewish consciousness. Judaism sees Mashiach and the future redemption as the purpose for which God created the world and the goal of everything we do. 2. Like everything in existence, Mashiach has both a body and a soul. The body of Mashiach, its outer physical reality, is the perfect world described by the prophets, a world of universal peace and prosperity. But this is only the external expression of an internal spiritual dynamic that empowers our progress toward this perfected world. 3. The soul of Mashiach is the process by which, through our observance of the mitzvot, the world is brought into harmony with its Creator and comes to fully express the goodness and perfection of God. Hasidic teaching describes this process as the goal to make a home for God in the lowly world. 4. Our physical world is the lowliest in the chain of the worlds that constitute God's creation. This is not because God is any less present in it. The divine reality equally pervades all realms of existence. But because it is here that godliness is most concealed, allowing for a world that can act contrary to the will of its Creator, and even deny God's existence. All the flaws and imperfections that plague our world are the product of this concealment. 5. Our task in life is to serve as God's partners in creation in developing the messianic world. As a perfect being, God experiences challenge and achievement through us when we transform our lives and environment into a home that expresses the divine goodness and perfection, resulting in the advantage of the light that comes from the darkness. Next week, superhuman versus superhumans. Okay. Well, thank you everybody for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. I, uh, Th this was a hard.